Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, extremal and probabilistic uh, combinatorics webinar. Uh, before we, uh, we start the, the talk itself, uh, let me uh, revise some, some rules here. Uh, the, the talk is being recorded. I think you were reminded uh, about that uh, uh, bef when you joined this, and it will be put on, on YouTube. Uh, so by participating, you are consenting uh, that, that this may uh, be uh, put online. And throughout the talk, so when we go, uh, when, uh, please, if you have any questions, ask them first in the chat. Quite often it happens that it's, these questions are answered uh, by, by uh, other attendees. And if uh, I see that it is needed, then I will, I will <coughs> mute you um, and let you uh, ask, ask the question. Mm -hmm. And so now let's begin. It's my pleasure to introduce Lutz Vanke from Georgia Tech and he will be talking about counting extensions in uh, random graphs. So, so please. Okay. Yeah, thank you um, for the invitation and the chance to speak here. Everything I'm gonna talk about today is uh, joint work with Mata Silaikis from Prague. And um, so I wanna talk about this um, subgraph extension counts in, in random graphs. And the natural context here is a classical topic of um, subgraph counts in the binomial random graph G and P, where each of the edges to edges is inserted independently with probability P. So for that topic, um, it's a very classical um, question to investigate the existence threshold. So we're interested in for which edge probabilities P, is it true that with high probability, meaning with probability 10 to one as n tends to infinity, that with high probability, we have at least one copy of H, okay? so. For which uh, edge probability P can we find, for example, at least one triangle? Um, once we know that these copies exist, the next questions we can ask, so what about concentration type questions? What conditions ensure that um, the number of copies of some given graph H is very close to the expected value? And there it turns out that by using the, the second moment method, you, by calculating the variance and so on, we can get very satisfactory answers to this question when is the number of H copies close to the expected value? And then you can ask many more questions about the number of H copies, like what is the distribution? What is the probability that you have too many or too few copies? So this is a very classical topic. And today, instead of looking in more detail at subgraph counts itself, I want to look at one natural uh, extension of subgraph counts, namely um, rooted subgraph counts. And um, so, let me not define at this moment what root subgraph counts really are, but we intuitively are familiar with this concept. So we want to understand, for example, um, what is the number of triangles that are contained in some vertex? What, or um, what is given two vertices, what's the number of paths of a certain length that connect these two, um, two vertices? And so now similar to the subgraph count where we can ask concentration questions, we can also now kind of ask these concentration questions for root and subgraph counts, we can say, okay, what conditions ensure that every vertex has roughly the same degree, close to the expected value? What conditions ensure that every vertex is in roughly the same number of triangles? And so on and so forth. So <clears throat> in other words, we can kind of want to understand when is it true that at every such set of vertices, we have the correct number of extensions. And I'll define this notion more precisely on the next slide, but I hope you see that by looking at here the degrees and each vertex and number of triangles, each vertex that uh, this is a very natural concept. Before I go into any more detail, let me just add, raise the question about what is the motivation for studying these um, uh, rooted subgraph counts. So first of all, I think it's an extremely natural generalization of subgraph counts. So nowadays we know such so much about these, uh, these random graphs that uh, definitely root subgraph counts are such a natural content, concept that we should be able to analyze them in great detail, and we should be able to understand them with all the machinery that we've built up. Uh, the second point is that these rooted subgraph counts quite frequently appear in many probabilistic proofs and applications. So, um, for example, um, one topic where they come up a lot is in the study of, of um, uh, zero-one statements in random graphs in the context of, of, of logic. 
um, they're basically they're they're very important. Uh, it's a very important concept, but really in most proofs that you see nowadays, rooted subgraph counts play some role. So, for example, if you look into even um, the analysis of random graph processes or the analysis of certain games on random graphs or e even um, various extremal type proofs, often you'll see at some point in the proof you want to say, oh, on the given set of vertices, they do not extend or do not sit on too many copies of some given graph H. This is something very useful to have uh, in the proofs. Okay, so root subgraph counts appear there all over the place. And finally, um, they're also a very natural testbed for, um, for concentration inequalities, because one way to at least get some sufficient conditions on, on, on these uh, root subgraph counts is by using a union bound plus concentration uh, inequality. You, the simplest example would be here when you try to understand when is every vertex have roughly the same degree to get a sufficient condition, you just do union bound over each vertex and apply channel of bound to the probability that one vertex has um, too few or too many um, neighbors. Okay, so um, that's where this topic fit, fits in. And we want to understand these rooted subgraph counts. Okay, so let me maybe briefly define what these rooted subgraph counts are. So, so for that, we first need to discuss what the rooted graph is. And it's really um, uh, a simple concept. Let me maybe move this graph here. So it's a simple concept. We're given some graph H and we have some designated um, set R, which we think of as the root. And in this talk, always the root R will be an independent set. So it, let's look at this example where we look at, um, say the number of paths of a certain length between two vertices, say here V1 and V2, then we could imagine that this set here would be the root um, of this path, okay? So we kind of need to specify which vertices are the root. Um, and in this talk, always the set of root vertices will always be an independent set, okay? So what about now these rooted subgraph counts in a, in a binomial random graph? So um, the way it works is as follows, is that we're gonna fix some set, or here's some ordered set of vertices, W1 to WR. And then we're gonna ask ourselves, what is the number of H copies in GNP where the vertices that we fixed, I, correspond to R? So in other words, the copies of H where um, the vertex WI from your set I gets mapped to the vertex vi here in the root set, okay? So, so one way maybe to, to think about this is that um, this entire thing here basically tells us um, roughly the number of extensions of i uh, to a copy of h in GNP. So that's where the name, uh, these extension counts come from because you can imagine that what is intuitively saying is I fix some uh, set of vertices i and I ask myself how, how many ways are there to extend it to a copy of h where the vertices of i play the role of the root of vertices in this rooted graph, okay? So I think it's best to, to study these definitions through, through a few, um, few examples. So here, um, I prepared a bunch of um, four examples. So again, always the root will be denoted here by this, by this circle, okay? So we have this, this first example here where we have this, this path of length two rooted at the end vertices. And uh, what does now rooted subgraph extension count mean? So if we look at say um, X R H of say two vertices, okay? So, in this case, I will consist of two vertices because we need to find where to put the, the roots. And well, what is that? Well, that will just be the co-degree of W1 and W2, okay? So for this particular rooted graph, if, if we fix some vertices W1 and W2 in our random graph, then this random variable is just the co-degree of W1 and W2. The next example is we have, we have um, this rooted graph here, so it's a triangle rooted at some vertex, 
and then exactly here now the rooted um, extension counts will just be the number of triangles. This will be the number of triangles containing W. Containing um, W1. And let's maybe do, do two more examples here. We have this, this, this path, which is rooted at the endpoints, and it's now exactly the same story, XRH of W1 and W2 is just the number of paths of length four containing W1 uh, and W2 as endpoints. So number of paths, we'll say length four, connecting um, W1 and W2, okay? Um, let's do one degenerate example. Suppose I give you some graph H and I'll just use the empty root. Okay, so it's kind of like a little degenerate case, but the idea is that if we look at, you, um, we don't specify any vertices as the root in our graph, then we exactly reduce just to the normal subgraph counts notion, okay? So X, R, H, empty set is just the number of H copies in our random graph. Okay, so you see immediately that this rooted notion also extends the, um, and the, the classical notion. Maybe to further get familiar with this notion, let's quickly also calculate the expected value. Say so that expectation um, of this random variable here. So um, just to fix notation, let's say that this is the expectation, I'll denote by mu um, subscript RH. So let's write for the expectation of this random variable. Okay, so here um, notes that this expectation does not depend on the particular choice of i, because by symmetry, every, every set uh, of vertices plays the same role in our, in our random graph. So what is the, so what is the order of magnitude of this quantity, okay? So the order of magnitude we can calculate for, for a fixed i, exactly the same way we do for normal subgraph counts, we, well, we fix the root, then we need to choose some vertices outside, in this case, vh minus vr many vertices outside, and then we need to ask ourselves, okay, um, we need to still place all the edges in there, and then we get an initial factor of p to the eh, okay? So note that here we do not need to subtract anything because we assume that our set r here was an independent set, okay? So this is just to get an idea of what's the expected uh, order of magnitude of this quantity. Okay, so what is the goal? So as I mentioned before, the goal is kind of to say, once we fix some rooted graph RH, we want to say that no matter at which set I we look at, we always get the, the correct uh, number of copies there. So. So if, for example, this would be our example where we look at the triangle rooted at the vertex, then what we want is that every vertex sits in basically the expected number of triangles up to some small error term, okay? Or if, if um, uh, here we would look at an edge rooted at the vertex, then this would just say every vertex has approximately the same degree. And so this was a notion that was studied by, um, in some paper by Scheller and Spencer, and then also by, by Spencer in several single author papers. And basically Spencer derived sufficient conditions which ensure that uh, you get these kind of concentration results. So here um, in this talk for the moment, I want to focus on one important special case, which is some notion of, of uh, strictly balancedness. So, in the context of normal subgraph counts, there's some notion which tells you, um, well, the graph is not too weird, okay? So just take my word for it. This class that I'm gonna describe here, the strictly balanced class, that's a very important class. So let's say let RH be strictly balanced. And just for now, think of it, it's a, it's a nice rooted graph. And what he showed um, in this paper 
is that for all epsilons, say in zero one, there exists some constant k, which here can depend on epsilon, r, and h, such that if we look at the probability um, that all of these extension counts are what they should be, so here plus minus epsilon times mu r h, Okay, so what this notion here means that um, that uh, our extension count is in one plus minus epsilon times the expected value. This is shorthand for saying that this random variable is at most one plus epsilon times the expected value and at least one minus epsilon times the expected value. And so what he showed is that this probability tends to one as n tends to infinity if the expectation is sufficiently large. So if this expectation is at least this constant times log n, okay? So um, this is something that we're on a intuitive level um, that sounds plausible. For example, if we want to show that every degrees in the, uh, in the um, every vertex has roughly the correct degree, then we're kind of familiar with it from channel bounds. Um, the expectation should be sufficiently large and typically we should get some kind of extra logarithmic term which corresponds to some uh, coupon collector type uh, phenomena, because we want to make sure that at every vertex we get the correct count. Uh, and so um, one can prove such kind of one statements, typically you will prove them by using some union bound argument over all possible choices of these uh, root vertices i, and then multiply it with the probability that you have the wrong uh, count at one particular choice of i. Okay, so, so this is the, the statement that he made for the strictly balanced case. Let's quickly look into what strictly balanced means. So I told you you should just think of it as strictly balanced uh, root of the graph means that the thing is nice. So in some sense, H is the most important or the densest subgraph. So you can give a formal definition of what strictly balanced means by saying, oh, if you calculate a certain density that this is maximized by um, uh, by H itself, but you know, it's I think for the purpose of this talk today, it's not so 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 important. Um, let's just look at some examples. So an example of a strictly balanced thing is what we already looked at: some path rooted here at some vertices, or um, if you take a cycle rooted at one vertex, this will also be strictly balanced. If you take a click rooted at one vertex, for example, something like this, this will also be strictly balanced. Okay, so, so many things um, that you can imagine, they'll be nice, but let's maybe for the example, see some non-example. So what is something that is not strictly balanced? Well, um, something like this will not be strictly balanced. You take some long path, and at the end, you put something very dense, like a K4, then it turns out that this part over here plays a very important role for the graph, whereas this, this path here, the existence of the path is not so important. Okay, so this is kind of an example of a graph that is not strictly balanced. Okay, so, so as I said, Spencer proved some general conditions which ensure that, um, uh, that you get at every um, i the correct number of extensions. And basically his question was, is, are his uh, conditions um, best possible? So is this sufficient condition, um, condition best possible? Okay, and, and this you can imagine now also connects back to the motivating questions that I asked because it often appears also in applications and so on and so forth. So there we really want to know whether we can relax these kind of conditions. So Let me maybe- can I, can I interrupt? So you yes. were drawing these examples of strictly balanced and unbalanced graphs, and, but you were drawing them with roots, but the, def, the root is uh, not in the definition, is it? Oh, I, I see. This, this G here should be R, I apologize. Oh, okay, um, thank you. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so it's kind of like saying, let's look at the, 
the number of um, uh, edges um, uh, divided by the number of vertices that are non-root vertices. That's the relevant density here. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so just to get a feeling what Spencer result uh, shows is so his proof shows that um, k tends to infinity as epsilon tends to zero. Okay. Um, and so as you can imagine now, what, what we did is we tried to understand this question. And um, let me tell you um, what our answer looks like here in the strictly balanced case. So, um, so again, we were going to consider some uh, strictly balanced graph. Be strictly balanced. Um, we need one new definition, and I'll, I'll explain in a moment where this comes from. Okay, so what we hear in addition insist that the thing is grounded. And grounded is kind of just saying the thing is not degenerate. So we want that there is an edge which connects the root with the remainder of the graph. That's all that we're requiring, okay? So, so what this is saying is that, um, if you look back here into the definition of these rooted graphs, I'm just kind of saying, oh, something like this is also a valid rooted graph, but it's kind of boring, right? Because if we have a root here at this vertex, then basically what we're looking at is just almost the number of triangles in the graph. And the rooted thing is kind of just a, um, a technical thing. Okay, so think of ground as just saying it's, it's non-degenerate. Then what we show is that, um, there are some constants, say alpha c big C bigger than zero, such that for all epsilon that are not too small, say in n to the minus alpha and one, that the following is true. So we get some kind of threshold result. So what we can show is that the probability that all the roots are correct, so that they're in, um, one plus minus epsilon times the expected value, that this as n tends to infinity goes to two things. So either zero or one. And the condition that we get here is um, if epsilon squared times the expected value is at most some small constant times log n, then we get the zero statement. And if um, epsilon square times the expected value is some big constant times log n, then we get the one statement. Okay, so what this is kind of giving us is some kind of um, uh, threshold result, which says that, oh, well, if the epsilon square times the expected value is sufficiently small, then it's not true that um, at every set i, we find the correct number of rooted subgraph extensions. Okay, so uh, whereas if we're just a little bit larger, so we, we go from this small constant times log n to this big constant times log n, then it's true that at every set i, we find the correct number of extensions. Okay, so, so one could say that this really kind of describes some kind of threshold uh, result. So we can say that this gives, um, threshold, threshold um, for the concentration of these subgraph counts of say, or let me call them extension counts. Um, I want to already make at this point one remark. Um, so, what is the main contribution here really of, of, of our result? So the one statement which says that, oh yeah, under, if this condition is true, then it's true that everywhere, for every choice of i, we get the correct number of extensions. Well, that's kind of nowadays uh, not too difficult. You do some kind of union bound of all possible choices i and ask yourself, what's the probability at one particular set i, you have the wrong number of extension counts, 
So our main one contribution here was to add this zero statement to find a, a way to prove this zero statement, which tells us that um, if epsilon squared times expected values is not too big, then we can find some set i where we have the, the wrong number of extensions. Okay. So we can say main contribution. is here the zero statement. Okay. And you might wonder now, so, um, so in this statement here of this, of, of this theorem, I made this extra assumption that the thing is, is grounded. So what about the ungrounded case? Well, let's quickly think about it. Ungrounded case. So I claim that in some sense this is a degenerate case where um, what we're really looking at is just the number of copies of H without the root. And um, the example to keep in mind is, is for example this example you root at one vertex and then you look at um, some triangle uh, outside. If you check the definition then this will also be strictly balanced under this definition for, for rooted subgraph counts. Just take my word for it. But I hope it's intuitively clear that if you look at what's the number of, of, of triangles which do not um, include one particular vertex here, well, that's roughly the, just the total number of triangles up to some small error term. Okay, so the situation changes. Um, in this example, we just have roughly the, the triangle count and also the conditions change. So if you look at the same um, statement as, as up, up here, then wait, let me quickly change the color here. Um, then what, what happens is that we again get some threshold behavior, but we don't need the log term. So here we get zero, one, but now the conditions change. So here we get that the condition is just epsilon squared times the expected value either tends to zero or tends to infinity. Okay, so, so the key difference is that in this ungrounded case, we do not need this log factor as in the grounded case. Okay, so by dealing with all these cases, now we really managed to answer this question of Spencer, which, um, which was asking under what conditions basically do we get these kind of um, concentration statements in the strictly balanced case? Okay, so if you, if we go back to his statement, then basically um, what our result shows is that for the constant K in his result, the correct behavior is um, that it scales like um, order epsilon to the minus two. Okay, so this is one way to interpret our result. Okay, um, this would be an excellent point also to ask, uh, ask questions. I, I'll maybe uh, wait for a few seconds if there are any questions in the chat. Okay, so... Oh. Okay, so one question that was asked by, um, by Shabnik in the chat was in the zero statement, do you get sets with too few copies or too many? So um, in the proof that we, um, that we const the, the proof we wrote down, we find uh, too many copies um, uh, in, in the range that we, oh no, okay. I, okay, I take that back. So in some range, of the parameters, I can guarantee that we find too many, but, uh, but not in general. So there are some ranges of the parameters where I cannot guarantee that we have too few or too many. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so let me otherwise move on and say something exactly about the, the zero statement, exactly what you were asking about. Um, so what is the kind of thing that we need to to prove. I just want to give you some feeling for what's going on. So um, this is, we'll try to basically what we need to show is we need to find some 
set of vertices i where we have the wrong number of extension counts. Okay, and as soon as you need to show that something bad exists uh, with high probability, well then um, your, your first guess is that you want to use the second moment method. You say second moment method. Okay, which basically you just count um, the number of bad bad sets i, and you hope to show that at least one exists by calculating the expected number of these sets and calculating the variance. Okay, which is corresponds exactly to calculating the first and second moment. But once we do this, we're going to run into some difficulties of which I chose uh, here to discuss two of them. So the first problem is that even if we just want to calculate the expected number of such bad sets, to do that, we need to get a good estimate on the probability that at one particular set of vertices, we have the wrong number of extensions, okay? And, and we need to be able to calculate these probabilities very precisely in order to do a second moment argument, right? So, so in other words, we would need to estimate this probability up to a factor of one plus little of one, but it's well known that estimating such kind of tail probabilities is very hard. Okay, so there, there are two conceptual things that make this, this, this difficult. On the one hand, I think that makes it difficult is that it's a very small, um, very small probability. And so it, it could be polynomially small uh, or even smaller than that, yet we need to estimate up to one plus the flow of one. This is something that's, that's typically quite challenging. And in fact, and this is exactly related to the question I got earlier, this problem, in some sense, it contains a very hard problem. Um, let me just say it contains, um, some people call the infamous upper tail problem. So, um, so what this is saying is that what we're really here uh, looking at is two different probabilities. One is the probability that you have too few copies uh, or extensions, and one is the probability you have too many. And it turns out that these two things behave quite differently, whether you have too few or too many. In particular, it's very hard to estimate the probability that you have too many of these copies. Um, um, uh, so, so definitely it will be very hard to estimate this up to one plus low one time. This would be one obstacle for if you would try to do a second moment calculation. That's one thing we have to, to handle. How can we estimate such probabilities? And the second obstacle that we run into is that somehow when we do second moment calculations, often we have some kind of local um, events and local structures in mind. We do a second moment calculation over, um, I don't know, the number of triangles in, in, in the random graph, but then every of the indicators that you look at is just some small local event, whether this triangle is there or not. If you look at here the event that you have the wrong number of extensions, it's, it's a very non-local event in some sense because it involves many edges of, of, your, of your random graph. Either you have too many copies, that means that many edges have to be there, or you have too few copies, which means that a whole bunch of edges need to be missing. So in some sense, it's a very non-local event. This is something that we're not used to when we do um, second moment calculations. So what we run into the problem is that this kind of depends um, on many um, edges of the random graph GNP, and that makes it hard to calculate uh, these um, covariance terms where we need to estimate what's the probability that at two roots simultaneously we have the wrong count. This will be challenging for these kind of more complicated events. So, so one thing that we do to, to sidestep these two, two difficulties is we use the freedom that we just need to show that there is a bad root um, which has the wrong number of extension counts. Nobody forces us to do a second moment calculation using exactly these, um, using these, exactly these events. We can kind of cook up some ben events which are better behaved, which we actually can control. Okay, so we just need to say, oh, some event happens which implies that at one particular root we have the wrong count. Okay, so, so here, for example, um, what we'll show is that with high probability, there is some set i um, 
which say attains um, say exactly one plus epsilon times the expected number of many copies due um, to in this case uh, the range where I where, where I wanted to mention here um, is um, due to say extensions. which are vertex disjoint um, outside uh, I. Okay, so if you, for example, would look into the example where you're interested in having the wrong number of, of triangles per one vertex, then what we would do is we would, for, for simplicity, just look at the event that you have too many triangles which look like this. Where all the triangles outside are are vertex disjoint, okay. So this this works in the um, in a sufficient range that we're interested in, and intuitively, if you look at having too too many copies of exactly this type, it's a much more structured event. You know exactly that certain uh, triangles have to be there, and certain other triangles uh, are not there. And it turns out if you look at such kind of events which impose some extra st structural information on on the wrong count these are things that are much more tractable you can do much more better explicit calculations for these uh, for these probabilities uh, without giving away too much okay because we as you saw we managed to prove that the the one and the zero statement up to a constant factor these two conditions match up okay so, so again, the, the key idea was kind of to, to sidestep these two technical difficulties by looking at a different event, in this case, uh, having too many copies of a very specific type. And the key point is that if we look at these very specific events, we can avoid some of the, these, these technical difficulties. And so we can push through the, the second moment calculation using a mix of several things. So, what our proof heavily relies on is some correlation inequalities. Um, the reason why correlation inequalities might be useful is because if you imagine such an event which says you attain a certain number of copies which are vertex disjoint, then it's basically that's a combination of an increasing event and a decreasing event. The increasing event tells you that some specific copies are there, and the decreasing event tells you that certain other copies are not there. So that's why correlation inequalities are useful there. And then we combine that. So correlation equals something like FKG or Janssen inequality. Uh, sorry, FKG or Harris inequality. Then we also use Janssen's inequality here heavily in the proof and some counting arguments. Okay. Um, uh, basically, in order to analyze this event, uh, that's what we do. We use these different uh, techniques. Okay. So. Once we adapt that, we can we can push through this second moment calculation, and that's about all the the glimpse of the proof that I want to give you here of the the zero statement. So, um, uh, so this is what we do in a certain range of the parameters. And if there are any questions, this would also be a good time to to ask. Okay. So uh, um, let's quickly go back to what was our main result. So our main result was related to the strictly balanced case. Um, and now our, in our paper, we also have some other results when, when these some partial results uh, for other graphs that are, the graphs are not strictly balanced. Let me just show you one which I find um, interesting. Okay, so looking at the general case, we want to drop the strictly balancedness condition. And so what is very natural, and this is something that we're, that's also done in the context of subgraph counts, normal subgraph counts, if you, um, if you want to, to consider the general case, suddenly not only the structure of the entire graph matters, but somehow you need to look at all subgraphs. And um, so in the rooted case, again, we can look at this example where we root at this vertex, so we have this long path where at the end we have this K4. And then intuitively you could imagine that clearly the fact that we have this K4 here is very important. We need to take that into, uh, into account. And in fact, 
it'll turn out that basically the K4 is much more important than this path. Okay. And one convenient parameter here is just to introduce some parameter phi, which is um, the minimum over all, uh, over all these expectations where instead of the root R, use something larger that sits between J and H. Okay, so it's kind of like saying, oh, suppose I replace the, uh, the root R uh, by something larger. Okay, so using this, this parameter, just believe me that is an important parameter, we can now, let me just tell you what some approximate result would look like. So um, suppose we again, we look at a uh, rooted graph, uh, rooted subgraph. And to not you know, um, deal with too many degenerate cases, let's make some mild assumptions on P. So um, just I don't need to write any extra conditions here. So let's just say that P of N satisfies two things. So we want once, let's, let's not worry about when P is very close to one, then we need to write some extra technical conditions. So let's just ignore that. So let's suppose that P is not too close to one. Um, and let's also assume that this phi parameter, that that tends to infinity. Okay. Um, this is just some, some, something that will be uh, very convenient. Um, and it's not a big restriction, take my word for it. So the statement here is that for all epsilon that are in zero one, we again get some approximate threshold statement. So remember, what was the thing that we're after? We wanted to say that for every choice of these um, vertices i, we have the correct number of extensions. So we were interested in this event. We have close to the expected number of, of extensions. And so here, some approximate statement is something like this. If epsilon squared times this phi parameter tends to zero, then we get always the zero statement. And if epsilon square phi is at least some polynomial thing um, in N, then we always get the one statement. Okay, so imagine this is uh, N to the delta for any delta. Okay, so, so what this is kind of saying is it tells you approximately where the threshold is. It's, somewhere between either epsilon squared tending to zero and epsilon square phi, some polynomial thing um, that slowly grows uh, some polynomial. Okay, so this kind of tells you that approximately where this changes from zero to some small polynomial, somewhere there lies the threshold where you go from the zero statement to the one statement. Okay, so there's some kind of uh, approximate result. And note that in this result, we have no assumption on epsilon. No assumption on epsilon. Well, let me say no assumption of form epsilon at least n to the alpha minus alpha is needed. Okay. So this is in contrast to our previous result. Okay. So now, as you can guess, what is the obvious open problem now? The obvious open problem is now to close this gap. Right? Because this here tells you that if this thing tends to zero, you get the zero statement. If this thing is sufficiently large, you get the one statement. So, but what we really want to know is we really want to know what is the correct condition for these zero and one statements. Clearly this brings us close, but it might not be the, uh, the, the, the correct answer. Okay. So, um, so I think I have just a few minutes left. So let me just say, one or two two words about um, uh, about this 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 problem, and I want to, to kind of just give you some indication that it might not be um, uh, that might be tricky. Oh, okay. I apparently made it an error in the definition of 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 phi here on this slide. Um, Okay, Th thanks Matas for pointing this out. I'll, I'll correct that in the slides later. <laughs> 
Okay. So, um, so the, the main open problem here was to determine the correct zero and one statements. And uh, so now you can make a lot of guesses what should be the correct, um, the correct zero and one statement. So one thing that's very natural to do is remember, um, Spencer, I say that Spencer actually had some sufficient conditions for the general case, right? Whereas before, and we just discussed the strictly balanced case. So the first thing one should tr naturally try to do is go back to that paper and see how does he prove the strictly uh, the, the the general case and check whether that gives the correct conditions in, in general. And so um, let's look at this this small example here. Let me just give you a flavor of of what Spencer would would do or this this proof of Spencer would do. So um, Spencer say reduces. to the strictly balanced case by requiring two things. Um, one is that, so let me maybe explain first in words how, what, what he does. So it's similar to some decomposition idea that's used in subgraph counts. So he would first think, imagine that you first extend this vertex here to a copy of K4. And then what you do is for every, of these four vertices, you're going to ask yourself how many, how many of sorry, how many of these these extensions do you have here? Okay, so if you can prove that every vertex is in the correct number of k4s, and for example that every co-degree here has the correct number of extensions, then you you get you can also show that this uh, entire rooted graph has the correct number of extensions. So let me maybe just in sloppily write it like this. So he would assume that every vertex. Um, is in approximately, well, we think of V as the root. So as it's, it's roughly the expected number of K4s. And then he would, in addition here, say every pair of vertices, vertices has co-degree. Approximately what it should be, say np squared. And if these two statements hold simultaneously, if every vertex is in the correct number of k4s and um, every pair of vertices, say here, has the correct co degree, then um, with a little bit of fiddling, you can see that now also this, uh, this rooted graph has the correct number of extensions. But what, what turns out is that here you get two conditions. So here you will get something like epsilon square phi of v comma k4, let's say sloppily it's much bigger than log n. And here you also get an extra condition. Um, let's say np squared, it's much bigger than log n. And it turns out that in some range, you do not need the second, uh, uh, the second condition here, okay? Um, so in other words, there is a range where the one statement holds although uh, holds in a range where uh, Spencer's general conditions are violated. Uh, it's not so easy to explain exactly um, the details of this counterexample, but the, the moral of the idea is the following. What you do here is a union bound over all vertices. And what you do here is again, a union bound over certain vertices. But it turns out that in some range of the parameters, in some range of the parameters, if you look at how these K4s evolve, um, they will mainly, sorry, if you think of, sorry. in some range, what will happen is that these copies of K4, let me draw them otherwise like this, that many of them will evolve disjointly. So now when you test for these extra co-degrees out here, you do not need to do a union bound again over all these points because these K4s here were growing out mainly disjointly. That means that when you look at the event that you have too few or too many um, extensions over here, um, what you're having is many actually independent events. So you do not need to do a union bound here for, for every uh, of these K4 copies. But okay, maybe that was now um, uh, a little technical, but just take my word for it that there's something inefficient in this general idea of always reducing to the strictly balanced case because 
in this decomposition where you say, okay, let's first every vertex in the correct number of uh, K4s and then every pair of vertices has the correct co-degree, there's some inefficiency in the union bound that is used. Okay, so basically you can get rid of the union bound here of the second case in some range of the parameters. The second example is my favorite, or perhaps was for a long time my favorite conjecture here that um, there should be a way, there should be a way to improve this, this, this condition, this one statement condition. Okay, so here we say epsilon square phi is at least n to the omega of one. And there are several uh, reasons that would let you believe that this n to the omega one, one should be able to replace it by something like much larger than log n, okay? Um, part of it comes from some uh, normal uh, heuristics, but it turns out that this is also wrong. So there is a counterexample which tells you that even if epsilon square phi is much bigger than log n, uh, there is an example where still the zero statement holds. And it's a minor variation of the graph that we've seen above here. So we, we have the details in the paper, but so it's this graph here. It's the same graph basically as before. We have here this copy of K4, but now instead of having this one co-degree out here, we have these two co-degrees out here, okay? And um, the, the, the key reason, uh, uh, um, let me just say it in words, the, the key reason how you can find a counterexample here is um, you find one copy of K4 where you just have a humongously large co-degree, okay? And if you look at the event that there's a K4 which, where one of the edges has a very, very large co-degree, there is a way to show that in some range, although this epsilon square phi is much larger than log n, you can still find this copy of K4 with a very large co-degree. And you can imagine that if you find a copy of K4 where, um, where here you have a very large co-degree attached to these, so you have a very large co-degree, then you also get the wrong number of counts here. Okay. Good. So the main message of these two guesses was that it seems to be tricky to guess exactly in general what the correct answer is. So you know, you're, I very much invite you to try your own ideas and conjectures here. I, I think it would be really nice to make some 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 progress here because um, uh, most of the the things here that um, uh, that Matas and I, I I tried we usually in the end managed to find a counterexample. Okay, so let me maybe uh, go to to summarizing. So what we were looking at we're looking at these extension counts in random graphs, which you can think of you know. Uh, number of H copies where the vertices of some fixed set play the role of the root. And um, what we basically analyzed is in particular the, the strictly balanced case. And we found some um, good threshold-like conditions for when these extension counts are concentrated, meaning that um, for every choice of I, you have the correct number of extension counts. So this would be a generalization of the statement that at every vertex you have the correct degree, or at every vertex, you have the correct number of triangles. And so we, we kind of found here some, uh, some kind of threshold statement in terms of this epsilon square times the, um, the expected value. This was um, answering this question that was raised by, uh, by Spencer. And in the paper, we have also some partial results for several um, other cases. And one of the main things I really want to advertise with this talk is that there's still a lot to be done. So in my opinion, you know, subgraph counts, it's such a natural thing. And with all the knowledge we have about random graphs, we should be able to understand what these correct zero and one conditions are. So um, I really invite you to, to look at this problem in more detail. Thank you very much. <laughs>